welcome you all to this uh, festival debate, debate event, Food Waste, Whose Responsibility Is It? hosted by PhD researchers, including myself at the University of Sheffield and in collaboration with the Grantham Centre for Sustainable Futures. So thank you everyone for taking the time to attend this session. Um, we hope it's going to be a really interesting and sort of engaging sort of chance to learn more about food waste and also engage in a sort of discussion about that as well and sort of think about a topic that really does impact us all. So we hope that you are sort of going to gain an understanding more of the creation of food waste at different stages of the UK food pathway and also take part in a discussion about where the responsibility for food waste lies and potentially what the steps of reducing that food waste could look like. So we're very grateful to be joined by three speakers who are each bringing their expertise on a different stage of the UK food cycle. And all our speakers are actually from Sheffield based organisations, which is going to be really interesting to hear some um, information about very local level initiatives, which I think is always really exciting. Um, so more generally, the session is expected to last for approximately an hour and a half, so finishing at around half three. And sort of generally across the session, we're first going to give each of our three speakers an opportunity to, pre to present their individual work and their sort of individual views on food waste. And so these presentations are going to last approximately 15 minutes each. And then once all the speakers have presented, they will then have the opportunity to answer questions either sent in by the audience members or sort of just discuss topics that might be brought up during those presentations. And sort of this final discussion is going to be chaired by Ollie Chesworth, who is a Grantham Scholar and whose research focuses on alternatives food sites. Um, so these are things such as social eating spaces, food hubs and pantries, and how these can create and shape local foodscapes. So I'm now going to hand over to Ollie, who's going to tell us a little bit more about today's speakers and sort of, sort of some more information about how you, the audience, can ask us some questions. Thank you, Ollie. Thanks, Abigail. Uh, look, it's lovely to have so many of you here. Um, and thanks again for our presenters and, and for the rest of the team for um, putting this talk together. Um, before we get into introducing the presenters, I just want to mention um, Step Up Sheffield. Um, so Step Up is a thank you from the University uh, of Sheffield for walking, wheeling, cycling or using public transport to get to the university. Um, you can download the app and register with your sheffield.ac.uk email address. Um, and you can use points that you accrue for those sustainable transport methods um, to uh, get things like uh, coffees and hot drinks across the university. Thank you. So on to talking about our presenters. So our first speaker today is uh, David Dixon. David Dixon is a co-founder of Future Greens. He will be presenting options for reducing food waste at the production stage. Um, we're also joined by Dr. Eleanor Kent from the Beanies Cooperative, who will be giving us the perspective of food waste production at the, sa uh, at the sales and consumption stage. Eleanor is a recovering academic and co-op member at Beanies Whole Foods, which was established in 1986. Beanies is an equal pay workers' cooperative governed by consensus. It has the largest organic store in Yorkshire and employs 14 full-time workers. The shop in Walkley is open seven days a week and the organic box scheme delivers across Sheffield and the Hope Valley. And finally, Renee uh, Major, uh, CEO of Foodwork Sheffield, which focuses on reducing food waste at the consumption and post-consumption stage. Thank you all for joining us. Um, a little bit of housework before we start in terms of how to ask questions. Um, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, we ask you to please put them in the Google Meet chat. Questions will be discussed once all of our speakers have finished their presentation, but please feel free to uh, ask a question at any time in that chat during the session. Um, unfortunately, because of the limited time that we have for this session, um, if we receive a large volume of questions, we may not be able to get to all of them. Um, with that done, thank you very much. and I'd like to hand over um, to David. Hi everybody, uh, I'm David, co-founder and CEO of Future Greens. We are a vertical farm based in Sheffield. We primarily, primarily grow leafy greens, so that's your baby leaf salad, lettuce, uh, things like that. I'll elaborate a lot more about so what our farm looks like and uh, how we go about growing greens here around in Sheffield, but first at like to talk about so sort of the food waste problem that we have as a as a farm. Um, next slide. Yeah. So looking globally, um, I mean, there's 15% of food produced is wasted 
uh, before it makes it up the farm. That's a statistic from the WWF. Um, and that is that translates to 1.2 billion tons of food that is yeah, produced, but then just doesn't make it off because the farmers are not harvesting it or it's not up to spec, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a lot of food wasted, but um, the, the and, and with that wastage also comes the wastage of the resources needed to grow it. So the water, the nutrients, uh, and, and, and the space, which also translates into about 10% of uh, global greenhouse emissions. If you, yeah, if you count for all the resources and the work behind, behind that food waste. And I'd like to talk a bit more about how that comes about for, uh, at least at our operation, I can't speak for other farmers. There's, there's many reasons, but, but I can uh, weigh in into why we've got some of the waste. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, I think the core uh, problem or, or the core phenomenon which causes food waste for our growing operation is, is this um, some juxtaposition of very short lead times from, from the, the customers that we supply, which are uh, shops, it's, it's food service and um, we don't personally supply manufacturing, but I know other farmers that do. Um, and mind you, we are very, very small. So we, we're a young company. We, we're just starting to, to sort of ramp up production. Um, but already sort of what we're seeing is our customers, um, uh, we're supplying the University of Sheffield, for example, um, and, and, and sort of, uh, Whole Foods organic shop in, in Netheredge. Um, they they really they they're responding to the demand of their customers so the people that eat there the, the the people that shop there which you know if the weather is nice they want lots of salad as the weather is not so nice they want less salad in our case right or is that they suddenly got a big meeting or a big event and they forgot to order something and so what we see is you know we're we're very likely to get uh, a, a 48 sometimes even 24 hour notification of okay we're gonna need this many kilograms of of your of your baby leaf mix which is great and i, and I get that but we we can't just conjure up uh, a head of lettuce in in 48 hours uh, so what that means for for our growing operation is uh, you know we don't want to disappoint anybody and we've you know we, we've had we we need to have stock available for when our customers demand it uh, otherwise we make them look back uh, bad etc cetera, etc cetera. so what that ends up with is that we're always growing a lot of a lot of salad and uh so that means when when one of our customers demands it we can harvest it supply it and that's great but if they don't uh, we essentially have to throw it away or find something else uh, to do with it uh, because, you know, most crops, not just lettuce, most crops have a, have a specific harvesting window. So they're great to harvest within a week. If you let them grow for longer than that, they just get out of spec. They're not as tasty, not as great looking, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> um, so on the, that's, that's that's really is what we're seeing on the demand side. That's a kind of sporadic demand is is was in our operation causing lots of lots of waste. And that's again, it's, it's not pointing fingers, but it is it is a phenomenon that I think most farmers um, um, struggle with. And yeah. Next slide, please. please. And sort of the second, so that, that's more the demand side and the sporadic sort of demand there and the expectation of farm farmers like ourselves to instantly respond to, you know, to lots of people wanting salad, basically, which, which is not really how crops work. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, you've got a, a problem of, of variable supply. So on the farm side, you've got things like the weather. Um, say if it's if it's really sunny, 
Um, so our farm is a is a special farm, right? So we we grow in a highly controlled environment. Uh, we're weather independent, uh, but I'll elaborate more about that in in, in a moment. But normal farms, the majority of farming is done outdoors or in polytunnels. So when the weather is great, you know, your your yields are exceeding expectations. When the weather is 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 bad, you've got less yield. To account for it, we see farmers usually plant a bit more than than they need, just so if it rains a lot or the weather is bad, they, they can still meet uh, meet the demand, expected demand. Um so so part of it is dependent on the variability of weather and with that is is um and like I said, if weather is better than expected suddenly you have a lot more crop than you can sell and um, and just like in that picture i know farmers don't usually don't even bother harvesting that because they can sell it anywhere and so it just kind of goes back into the soil and what's there so weather is one Quality, quality is another. It's also tied to weather, but um, it also can occur as a, as a result of pests. That basically some of your crops don't look as great, don't don't have that sort of sellable quality. Even though a lot of times they're still perfectly edible, they're still perfectly, you know, taste the same. Maybe looks like you know your wonky vegetables, but your retailers uh, just aren't willing to pay for that. And so you're ending up bidding that crop essentially, or just taking a heavy, heavy sort of discount on, on selling it. Which again, that, that quality aspect and, and having to throw away or waste good crop is, is quite tightly um, tied to things like weather, things like pests. Um, those are factors. And then lastly, transport. Because now more and more we have a, a global economy, right? So we're importing a bunch of things. You know, the UK itself imports roughly 75, 80% of its fruit and vegetables. Those are our long supply chains. You know, food spends days at the, the back of a truck, and it spends days in warehouses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that definitely decreases shelf life and makes it so a good percentage of of food is just spoiled between either either in the in the in the long supply chain or it gets to the stores with only a few days of shelf life in it and it wastes it it, it basically um, goes off before it can be sold um so that's that's the the the, the supply supply sort of side uh of waste what we this, this is not specific to our operation. This is more what, what I see from, from talking to other farmers as well. Um, next slide, please. And um, yeah, to tell you a bit more about our business. So we are a vertical farm. What does that mean? That um, you can see it in the picture. It's it's a highly controlled environment. That's that's what we do. Uh, it doesn't look quite like this but but the principles are the same so it's it's using artificial light it's it's using indoor space um and uh yeah a perfectly controlled both sort of fertilizer and and climate and what that makes us is it makes us completely independent of the weather so we can grow uh the same head of lettuce whether it's December or it's August or anything in between. Um, what that helps us achieve is a, a very consistently high quality. So we, we um, you know, that's linked to A, because we control the, the, the environment and make sure it's optimal at all times. But B, um, it also helps protect us against pests and disease that you, you know, you're more susceptible to on the outside. Of course, that doesn't come automatically. We have to take you know, drastic measures to, to prevent pests from getting in. But um, as a vertical farm, you definitely have more control in that aspect. And also what's great about uh, vertical farming is that you can really do it anywhere where you've got space. So right now we're based in a, in a former steel factory in, in, just in the outskirts. Sheffield and Attercliffe, 
uh, but that's really close to to the city as opposed to uh, an arable farm which you know you have to be in in, in kent or 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 cambridge or, or something like that um for it to really make sense and so the distances or you can't even really grow in the uk you know for for a big chunk of the year you can't even really grow lettuce in the uk outside for example and it has to be imported from, from spain and italy and the like and the fact that we can do that we can sort of shorten those supply chains significantly also means we have a fresher product and um and there's less less waste in the supply chain now the drawback of that and and, and uh it's going to get into to what our company uh, does and what problems it solves the drawback of this is this is a very energy intensive exercise it's, it costs a lot of money to control the environment year round both the lights and the climate uh, and, and things like that and that's why we've seen a lot of these farms fail in the past but that is uh, where we as future greens saw the opportunity um to fix that essentially uh, next slide please and um yeah this is this is uh what we do so we are approaching vertical farming with a heavily circular uh, circular solution uh, we use what's called anaerobic digestion so that's a technology to convert food waste into um, electricity nutrients water heat and, and carbon dioxide we get all of that from organic waste and that we source locally currently we've built up proprietary anaerobic digester from scratch in order for us to do that do that better than than is currently done um and at the scale which is yeah, quite quite small and fits within a an urban environment so what that helps us do it helps us reduce our costs by up to 65 percent compared to a vertical farm that does not have our technology um helps us stay small helps us stay local close to communities and cities um the, helps us grow local fresh salad um, that we're already supplying and we're working with uh, food businesses so right now we're working with Arca Mali for example to collect their sort of organic waste and power our systems and because um, you know we've got great relationships with those types of businesses we're sourcing waste for free which is uh, which in essence means we get the main input of our entire vertical farm you know being those 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 elements uh, in the in the top left here we get all of that for free from organic waste um next slide please and yeah just just uh refer it back to the old side so it not only helps us save you know lots of the costs that other big vertical farms have in in buying everything from the grid it also helps us offset carbon uh because you know each each sort of kilo so for each kilogram of lettuce that we grow uh, the the amount of waste that we're sort of diverting into our anaerobic digestion system and extracting sort of nutrients from it and energy um we're offsetting 36 kilograms of carbon um, so that's yeah that's another future of of our systems and this is just a, a slide to just show you where we are right now like i said we're based in Attercliffe. we've built our anaerobic digester which is uh, just starting to generate energy um we've we're growing baby leaf salad in our systems indoors and uh, we're currently supplying one store uh that's that's whole foods in, in that edge but uh hopefully uh, scaling that that operation up as our systems become uh, become more established and and we've uh know we've raised venture capital funding to to build this so we're we're funded by uh venture capital and a grant from defer as well um thank you that's, that's future greens in, in a nutshell thank you very much david that was excellent um I'm going to now move on uh, and, and introduce Ella and uh, Eleanor Kent from Beanies once more um, and let her talk through um, uh, Beanies Whole Foods and, and their processes around uh, waste reduction and their own processes. Thank you. 
Hi, Ali. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, and thanks, for that, David. It was really interesting to hear about your operations. Um, so I'm a co-director of Beanie's Whole Foods. Uh, we're a workers' cooperative um, up in Walkley, and that's a picture of our shop. And we were founded in 1986, so we've been going for quite a long time. Um, and the important, this is an important piece of information, re our behaviour around food and the waste system is that we're an equal pay workers co-op and so we are founded on the assumption that production is for use and not for profit. Okay, next slide please, Ollie. Um, is that the next slide? Damn. Okay, so this is a this is an overhead shot um, photo credit to Mark Harvey of some of the surplus food that we redistribute um, from our shop. So we have surplus food collections every day of the week. Some of it goes to Foodworks um, and to various other charitable organisations. So we go to St Mary's um, and a couple of other places. And um, what, what you can see here is a small sample of that food. But what I want you to notice is that um, if you focus in on this, quite often these are this is whole cases of food. Um, so there are, we're talking about three categories of food waste that we manage from beanies. One is stuff that we discount that still does end up going to our customers. The other is stuff that we donate. So that's food that is still usable, um, but we've decided we're not going to try and sell it. And then there's the compost. Um, so the questions that I'm going to try and answer are, what is this waste? Like, how do we come to decide what gets reallocated? Um, and what are the kind of processes that we go through to get there? Next slide, please, Ollie. Okay, so I'm going to focus on our organic section. We've got two sections for fresh produce in the shop, um, the non-organic section and the organic section. Um, so the non-organic section, I'm just going to sort of bracket, but I'm happy to answer questions about that, but it works in quite a different way. Um, the organic section is, um, is kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of the volume of our organic veg scales, because if you look at the next slide, you'll see that we also run an organic box scheme. Now, um, our accounts are publicly available, so you can check this for yourself, but the box scheme is worth about a third of our total turnover. Um, so it, the, this means that our net sales of organic veg is much bigger than the footprint of the shop would indicate. Um, and what the box scheme means for us in terms of procurement is that because it's a subscription model, you know, David was talking about this very unpredictable supply and demand situation that growers have the box scheme we get an economy of scale from that and a very predictable uh, sales behavior we've got years and years of data what's going to happen week by week so in terms of our ordering we've got a very close relationship to what needs to come in and when and um, the box scheme dictates that uh customers have to shop seasonally because we decide what goes in the boxes um, and because we have the shop if something goes wrong in the ordering of the box scheme like everyone suddenly goes on holiday or um some stock comes in and it's not quite up to scratch we need different kinds of substitutions or we need to shift some stuff out of the box scheme we can put it in the shop and we don't just necessarily put it in the organic shop we can distribute it across the whole of the rest of the shop so we've got this huge amount of flexibility built into what's actually an unusually predictable retail system that means we can mitigate waste at that point in the chain um yeah and note also the very low packaging um you see where we're, we're going loose into the boxes uh, by weight um okay Next slide, please, Ollie. So I said there were kind of multiple categories of food waste that we deal with at Beanies. This shot is on the, <laughs> in front of the like wooden wall, there's a little area here and this is our half price zone. So what we will do is we will discount produce early so that it is still desirable to customers. Um, and this is stuff that will still be good that day or for a couple of days, um, but it isn't necessarily gonna set on shelves for the rest of the week. 
Um, and there's quite a lot of decision making that goes into this. And I think what I really want to emphasize is that at Beanies, our investment is not so much in um, this is not a system that anyone could just plonk into when we could ask them to perform tasks. We rely on having staff who are skilled to recognize what's going on with the produce and understand the um, ordering cycle of that produce. So for example, that broccoli might be decent broccoli. If I've got two cases of broccoli in the chiller that I know are better quality and there's another shipment coming tomorrow, that decent broccoli is going to go in the half price. I'm going to put the best broccoli on the shelf, knowing that more broccoli is coming in two days time. That is a level of like integration and knowledge that I don't think supermarkets are able to enact. Um, we might though, if we've got a whole case of something and say like one out of every five apples is bad, decide that it's not worth our time and money to root through the case. And that's the point at which the whole case gets sent off to charity, to, to like another kind of waste distribution center. So there's that kind of judgment that we expect the staff who are putting the stock on the shelves to be able to undertake um, rather than having a like a wrapped product with a barcode and a date on it that is that is the thing that determines whether or not it gets moved on. Okay. Um, how am I doing for time? I'm about five minutes in, aren't I? Um, okay, so then we've also got the compost bin. So that that box there, oh no, that's not the compost bin. That box there is actually the produce that's been called out to send immediately to charity. Um, so that is stuff that you, you can see there are like, there are single bananas in there. There's one aubergine, they look like a couple of Swedes. So that's stuff that can be cooked and used that we know from experience people aren't going to pick off the shelves. So there's no um, there's no guidance for this. This is the person who handles this stuff day in, day out, just knows that she's not going to be able to, as Gemma um, in this case, is she knows that she's not going to be able to sell that aubergine, but she knows it's still useful to someone. So she's made a decision there um, to behave in that way. Um, you show us the next slide, Ollie. Right, and this is the compost. <laughs> So these are the trimmings. So I brought a stunt lettuce, actually, which I thought not like a Liz Truss style stunt lettuce. Um, although, you know, who knows? It might, might outlast the government. So we, the last slide is the lettuce slide, but I'll, I'm going to jump with one and go for the lettuce. So we buy our lettuce loose in boxes, um, in crates. And when it comes to putting it on the shelf, we will trim off outer leaves that goes in the compost. We might clip the bottom off it because it's a bit brown and we'll pass it up to make it look nice. And while we're doing that on the shop floor, we're taking those clippings and we're making sure that they go into the into the appropriate bin. And that's also something that we're able to do because we sell up most of our produ produce loose by weight. And even where we do sell it as a unit, we'll usually go through that. So it takes that that slide that showed our organic section it takes one staff member three hours before we've opened to set up all of that produce um it, you know if you're familiar with kind of the that kind of system design the question that the obvious question might be like how come you can afford to behave in that way like how come you can afford to pay someone to handle that produce so carefully um, and I, I think my answer for beanies would be that we we're not it's because we're not funding an executive salary we're not a pyramid scheme that pro the profit stays in the business so we can afford to act with care towards the stuff that has value to us so it's not it's not cheaper for us to just put things in the bin um it's it's better value to our business to take care with the produce that we have you look at the next slide um, and then this is the compost. So the compost that we create, that we cull, you know, you can see it's mostly clippings. It's it's rare that we'll have like a whole case of something that just needs to go straight into the compost. It does sometimes happen, but mostly this is the trimmings. It's the green waste, like the outer leaves of the cauliflowers or the, the whatever that we process on site. Um, supermarkets don't do that. The compost goes back to the farm that suppliers. So we operate in as close to a zero waste food, food, food loop as I think 
we could possibly get. I can't really see how we could improve this. Um, so the compost goes back to one of our growers. Um, and the reason that it's easy for us to do this is because he comes to the site to drop the veg off. So there's no additional step in the process. It's just that when he takes something out of his car, he puts this back in it and then goes back to his field. It's not, it's not built in any additional complexity. It's not onerous for us. It doesn't cost us any more. In fact, it costs us less because we have to pay for our black waste and we don't pay Matt for this. <laughs> We, we pay him like a little bit of extra for the other kinds of maintenance work that he does, but basically this is just built into our our rhythm. How am I doing for time, Ollie? I'll keep going. All right, let's have a look at the next slide. Um, and so this is Matt. This is this is our grower. Uh, some of our growers, Matt and Elle, at the field. Um, they are in Lightwood Lane. If we have a look at the next slide. So this is in uh, Moss Valley, it's just off the ring roads, it's under eight miles um, from the shop. So we're looking at, and this is, we, we have like lots of different organic suppliers, um, but the reason that I've chosen to talk to you about Matt, can we skip back one, Ollie? Is that because he's so close, um, we have a very fluid relationship with him and the way that he supplies the shop. So, um, I mentioned the box scheme. If we come up short on something that comes into the box scheme, we can ring Matt and say, can you run out and pick this thing that is coming? And um, we also work with him very closely. If he gets a surplus of stuff that he needs to sell, we can shun our other supplies for the week and we can change things around in the non -organic. Like sometimes we'll put organic produce in the non-organic section at knockdown price because that's better than it going to waste for both us and for him. Um, so having this like really close, really integrated relationship um, helps us to mitigate that waste. Um, but I also spoke to Matt ahead of this talk about what waste management looks like for him. Because um, I was, I wanted to ask him particularly about about the compost and about what, what how often he finds himself in the position of having food that has to go to waste before it's been harvested. And his answer was really interesting. And what he was saying was that actually in, a, in an organic system, a plant in the ground would never be considered waste. So he might occasionally get such a high level of damage or crop failure um, that he has to rotate that back into the soil. From his perspective, that's a waste of time. Um, and maybe it's a bit of a waste of money because he spent the money on seeds. But he's, he, a field of plants is generating an ecology and energy in the soil. I'm drifting onto like a kind of side of like soil science that I'm on, I'm on quite thin ice here, but I'm trying to report what Matt said. <laughs> um, yeah, for him, a plant in the ground is, um, is, is doing a purpose. So he would say that there's no particular loss to the system of having to plow that back in. Once he's harvested, He's very, very rarely in the position of having to waste that produce, but he, much like Beanie's, and I still have a very long-term relationship with Matt, he, he used to work for us directly. Much like Beanie's, Matt's got a very integrated relationship with uh, restaurants and um, with, with the guy who makes sauerkraut. So like when they've got a really high level of crop damage for the cabbage, but it's still tasty, that organic cabbage will go to the sauerkraut guy and it'll still get used. Um, and one of the things that he did say was that it's so important for him to understand how that produce is being used so he can select well. So like he supplies um, Tonko Bakery um, and supplies them apples, right? Okay, what are you doing with the apples? If they're carbonizing the apples, they can have the apples that are a bit scruffy because it's going to taste just the same. If they're putting them onto a soup, onto like the top of a tart and it needs to be really decorative, he can choose something different. So that kind of flexibility um, which both we have and which Matt has and which we have because of our relationship with Matt means that there's a lot of give in the system in terms of yeah where the food goes and when it goes. Um, can we skip? I think I'm about ready to wrap up because I think I slightly juggled my lettuce speech if we go to the next one. Um, Yes, okay, right, that's our harvesting lettuce. I think I'm done. If we skip back, have I got time to make one last point, Ollie? Okay. 
I just wanted to show people the, um, this is an overhead shot of the farm that we use. You can see like right in the middle of that image is the, um, the Moss Valley site. There are multiple growers on there, Matt's one of them. And then just down into the left, you can see the regather field, which we're quite collegial with them, but that's another kind of patch of green. And then all around that is pig farming. So it's so brown, it's so monocultural, and this is, um, I don't know exactly what time of year this is, but it's over summer sometime because there are leaves on the trees. The diversity of, of plant life and ecology in the organic um, fields that you can see is, is notable from the air to me. Um, and part of the reason that we're committed to selling this produce is because this is what it generates environmentally. Um, yeah. End transmission. Yeah, I was going to make a point about the environment, but we've all seen this report. Like, we, we know. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ali. Thank you very much, Eleanor. That was a really wonderful presentation, incredibly informative. Um, before we move on to, uh, before we open it up to questions, which can happen later, I want to begin, uh, I want to now ask Rene um, to, to present. Uh, Rene, thank you very much for introducing um, Foodworks um, to us. No worries. Yes. Uh, so, hello everyone. I'm Renee. Um, I work for Foodworks. Uh, although I won't be talking about Foodworks much, but I'm very happy to take some questions on that if anyone's interested. Um, you can go to the next slide if you want. So, um, so who's responsible for food waste? And I just sort of dive into the definition of the question a bit there, because I think there's sort of two ways to look at responsibility. On the one hand, there's the aspect of who's accountable for it, who who caused food waste, um, where does it happen? But there's also a slightly different question, which is who's got the obligation to actually deal with that? And that's not always the same person. If, uh, if, if my cat destroys the neighbor's flower bed, then my cat's clearly the cause of this problem, but it's probably still upon me to be responsible for that and have the duty to deal with that. Um, I mean, ultimately, I think that the, the responsibility question very quickly becomes a bit of a pack the buck, pass the buck thing for me. Uh, since since food waste has come to public attention, um, probably over the past decade, mostly, it's, it's a question that's asked a lot. But most of the time, I think the way the question is answered is it's answered by parties who have the budget and the level of organization um, like government and industry. Um, and they end up agreeing reports together that largely blame the parties that don't have that, which is the public. And so, so we've increasingly heard things like two thirds of food waste happens in the home. And um, I'm highly skeptical about numbers like that because that's the context within which they're produced. It's very convenient to say, well, it's all consumers fault, it's all the public's fault. Can you now please feel guilty and shut up about it? Thank you. Um, so, so let's let's but let's look at this anyway. So who is accountable for food waste? Let's have a look at where it happens. We can do that on the next slide. So this is a start. Uh, these numbers are old. They, I think most of them are pulled. I mean, from I think from Tristan Stewart's book, uh, which is called Waste, and then something in the subtitle I forget. <laughs> um, so that was published in two thousand and nine, and Tristan really started the whole sort of public awareness, I think, and and later outrage around food waste. Uh, I think the numbers are in in billions of tons globally, although really this is about the picture more than the number because there are so many ways to look at this number. It really loses validity in terms of you know whether is this is industry weight waste 2.4 tons or 2.8 tons like that. That's not a really usable um, discussion. Um, so for instance, there's problems around definition, right? If I if I cut off the stem of a cauliflower and I chuck that away. Is that food waste? Is it is it an edible part? Is it an inedible part? Like there's a lot of ways to define food waste or there's a lot of ways to assign responsibility. So we've talked about ordering challenges and you know, particularly with large retailers, they have a lot of power. They can cancel orders quite late. Harvests are already happening and crops already in the ground. If that food can't go to market, whose who's waste is that? Is that the farmer's waste? Is that the supermarket's waste? Who's responsible for that happening? Um, if a supermarket promotes a two for one offer of uh, bagged salads that are, don't have a very long life and a consumer buys that and ends up wasting one of the packs, whose responsibility is that? Um, 
And then who really measures all of this, right? Because the data is very, very patchy. And so what do we do with the gaps? And so there's a lot of room there to, to maneuver. But ultimately, I think this picture is a very reasonable picture. And what we do agree on is that largely out of the food supply we have, we waste about a third between industry waste and household waste. Like that's a ridiculous amount. Um, and that's an even more shameful amount if you look at sort of in the top there, it's a shortage. That's a technical uh, <laughs> word for basically people going hungry, right? So the food we need to feed every single person on the planet that is going hungry and make sure everyone has enough nutrients to feel content, happy and healthy is less than a quarter of the food we waste. So I could end my talk here because then do we really need to talk about responsibility? That is such a ridiculous problem to have. We should just all close our browsers now and go and solve this clearly. But let's let's go a bit further. Um, so if we if we look at this picture in a bit more depth, actually the, the problem is is even more severe than I just outlined. Um, because if you go further back. Um, David mentioned uh, farm waste. Um, like most of the farm waste, certainly at the time that, that Tristram's book was was published, uh, was barely um, was barely recorded. So this is a, this was a very rough estimate. And since then, uh, I think most of the figures have come have uh, have indicated that farm waste, because the pre farm gate waste, is much higher. You know, before we even talk about what is a food supply, a lot of food has already been wasted on the farm for various reasons. It's interesting at the moment that DEFRA has, has released some money, about 15 million pounds, to for organizations like ourselves to work with farms to redistribute more of the surpluses. And that's really positive um, in a way. But also, I mean, it's a pittance, obviously, right? <laughs> if we're looking at how big this is as a national problem. But also, like, it sits a bit awkward in the context of a post-Brexit world where some of that farm waste, at least, probably doesn't ever leave the farm because the farms couldn't source the labor to do the harvest. So whose responsibility is that, really? Interesting question. Um, we can go to the bottom of that graph, and, and what we see there is the fact that we consume meat. And... And I'm not really wanting to go into the whole ethical side of things. You know, that's a very subjective debate and everyone needs to make their own choices. But the truth is meat is not a very efficient way for us to get our nutrients. That is just objectively true. Um, and so the food we produce that we don't end up eating, but end up feeding to animals um, is about three times the amount of food that we actually end up uh, receiving from the animals we slaughter and then put into the food system. So you could really argue that for every, for every kilogram of meat I consume, I've actually already wasted two kilograms of food before we've even started. Um, so that's a, that's a very, you know, it's a very depressing picture in a way, because we've got a food system that produces 15 and a half billion tons of food while it only needs 8.6 tons of those to feed everybody. And then somehow still manages to let one in nine people in the world go hungry. That's where we are. Um, so um, let me just check where I am in my story. Um, but again, you, you, you need to think about, well, how, how, do, how does this happen, right? So if we go to the next slide, uh, this is my attempt to picture a systemic problem. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there aren't simple answers to any of this because otherwise we probably would have solved this already. These aren't things we sort of design to happen like this or that we choose to happen like this. They are a side effect of a systemic problem. Um, and and in my view, that systemic problem is neoliberal capitalism. Because um, there are many, many reasons why food is wasted um, in terms of the direct reason. Um, but ultimately, most of those boil down to how do we make decisions? And in businesses, we only make decisions in one way, generally, which is what makes the most financial sense to do right now. 
And so if we only value things in terms of their financial potential, then this is where we end up. For instance, if, um, if an online retailer needs a system that deals with order cancellations and returns stock from distribution hubs to main, uh, main warehouses, they need larger warehouses, they need a different stock management system, they need fans to actually deal with the returns and those fans need a driver. And that's expensive and food is cheap. So actually it makes much more sense to not bother with order cancellations and just dump all of that perfectly fine food in the bin if it's at the distribution hub where an order gets cancelled. That's a purely financial decision. Um, another example is if a supermarket knows that having fully stacked shelves will make the shop way more attractive to customers and increase custom by 10%, but they know as a result they'll waste 5% of the extra food that they put on the shelves, that's a great business decision. And so shops will do that. And that is what they do. That is why shelves are full. Not everything will be sold, but we won't shop in a shop that has empty shelves. Or a luxury brand might actually choose to waste things rather than discount them. If they think their customers will buy the full price product anyway, why would you bother selling a discounted item? Because you're undercutting your own sales. That makes no sense. What makes financial sense is to just chuck the stuff that's slightly subpar and go straight for the full sale. So most of the reasons why they are many, ultimately, a lot of them boil down to finance. Um, and and, and in the context of the uh, the luxury brand, for instance, you could also really question this this push to, um, you know, if we, if we look at the context in which food waste and the solutions to food waste are presented currently, like a lot of times um, it's talked about in the context of poverty and how we could just solve poverty by feeding poor people waste. And aside from the ethical challenges with that, to say the least, um, you could also maybe cynically wonder, is that a reason for supermarkets to make sure that they don't undercut their own sales by making sure food is redistributed to people who can't afford to be their customer in the first place? Are they really genuinely trying to do good or are they protecting their own business? I'll not answer that question here. It's recorded, right? <laughs> Um, so there's a million ways in which this all plays out, but like I said, most of the times underneath that, there's a financial decision. Um, and, and that is a result of the fact that we've created this sort of ultra liberal market economy. Um, and then the question is, well, are, are we doomed? Is this just an inevitable side effect of the system we're in that we can't solve? I don't think that's the case. You can go to the next slide. Um, because a market, oper a, a market economy can work really well, but you need to define the playing field. So a market is an excellent problem solving mechanism to optimize supply and demand, but we need to set it the right problem, the right context and the right limitation and constraints. So for instance, historically, European cars have been way more fuel efficient than American cars. Why is that? That isn't because European car makers are way better than American car makers, that isn't because European consumers really value that a lot more than American consumers and they're somehow different people. They're not. The reason that that's happened is because the EU has, uh, across the whole uh, continent, uh, implemented qu uh, quite serious duties on fuels on the one hand, and on the other hand, has set very strict standards on minimum fuel efficiencies for cars sold on the continent, and those efficiencies are increased periodically. And so that's created an environment, a level playing field, where all those car producers have to uh, both make sure that they comply with that legislation and also push consumer demand for cheaper cars because fuel is very expensive. So we can create a playing field that allows the market to work without causing damage, but we need to accept that that requires legislation. We need to constrain and guide the market for it to do its job. And so really, um, the most important thing there is that we should not vote for any politicians who claim that deregulation is somehow a good thing. Anyone who claims deregulation is a good thing does not understand markets or a market economy, and you should not vote for them. Um, 
Anyway, uh, at the same time, realistically, I think, you know, the, the current climate uh, also means uh, the UK is, is very isolated, uh, it's got a, a poor and failing economy, um, and whether this is high upon the agenda of legislators to actually tackle is probably quite questionable. So, uh, realistically, this doesn't really get us anywhere, I think. Um, so, um, and, and then this is where a lot of apathy really comes from right we, we we might have found a way for like where should this problem be solved there's no way for it to actually realistically ever happen so why should i worry about it let's just go buy an ice cream or netflix and chill or whatever else and not worry about this anymore and 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 here we are um so let's try and move beyond that and beyond this slide um so let's let's try and figure out what change might look like um so maybe we should go from who is responsible or who is accountable or whose duty is to fix this to well what can we write here in this conversation all uh, 66 of us what what can we do to actually make a difference where where does that start um and if if we've agreed that this world isn't acceptable i'm just going to make the assumption that we would all like to see a slightly better world then what are we going to do about it? Um, we can go to the next slide again. More systems. So again, we're obviously we're back at the individual now, but what I don't want to really um, go back to is this idea of blaming the consumer and blaming the individual so that we feel guilty about us making the wrong choices. Let's actually revisit why we make those choices. Like in the same way that businesses make decisions because of the context and the system that they function in, which for instance is legislative, we do the same thing. We exist in a context and we're not always maybe, maybe consciously aware of this context, but our decisions are guided by the context that we live in. And maybe if we try and tweak some of that context for ourselves, then it will be easy for us to make slightly different decisions. Um, I've got a bit of stuff on the next slide to talk about what that might look like. So, so for me, that's a lot about how we see our role in the world. Um, we're, we're raised, schooled and educated and um, uh, to be consumers. That is our role in the world. We, we are consumers and our role is to um, make choices and transactions in life to optimize for personal benefit uh, at any point. And somehow that is going to create the perfect world through the magic of markets. And it, it reduces our whole role in life to a true and transactional one, right? If I'm a consumer, I a, have a, the right to make choices, more choices good. I have a right as a consumer for choice. I have a right to convenience and I should optimize choices by convenience and I should optimize choices by, by price. That's how being a consumer works. And that is my only job in this world. And, and that is where a lot of this stuff happens, right? So um, I realize this right at the beginning of Foodworks when we still were the real junk food, junk food project Sheffield. And I was on a, on a long weekend with my partner at the time in the Lake District. And it was Saturday and it was four o'clock and we hadn't bought anything for, for dinner yet. And so we went into this small village. We just on like a, a really long day walk and uh, walked into a butcher's and the whole sort of uh, chilled sort of um, display was empty and about two sausages. And my first response was, what's a rubbish shop? There's nothing here <laughs> uh, in this little rubbish village. Village like that's that's the first emotional response you have have when you walk into a shop like that. And then I thought, no, actually, this this is exactly right. It's a Saturday. This shop was closed tomorrow. It was my choice to come here at four o'clock on a Saturday rather than to prepare and you know make sure I've got my dinner sorted. This is my problem. I'm okay with sausages. Why don't I just buy sausages? Why is this such a problem? I, I don't need this choice. Me having choice has a cost, but we don't think about choice as something that's costly. We don't think of convenience as something that's costly. If Amazon can helicopter a pint of milk into your back garden within half an hour's time, that's extremely convenient. But that means Amazon needs to hold stock close to your house that it doesn't know it's ever going to sell. And if you don't order that pint of milk that day, then what is that milk has nowhere else to go. And so that milk is wasted. Your convenience is not free. 
So I think we need to reprogram who we are and to stop thinking of ourselves as consumers and start realizing that actually we are citizens in an ecology. We are interdependent and interrelated with each other, with the rest of the world, with the planet. You know, everything is an interrelation and an interaction. And um, if we start looking at the world like this, we will start to make different choices. And that is that also takes away this whole idea that change needs to be painful. If we think about um, over over the pandemic period, where you know lots of um, lots of people needed help, and actually government was largely failing to provide the help that people needed, and all spontaneously these mutual aid groups popped up. That is citizenship, right? That is people spontaneously deciding to help each other. And actually maybe discovering in the process that, well, surely I might, I'm helping my neighbor and actually us working together as citizens and, and realizing that we're together in all of this, it's also a really nice thing really by itself. Realizing that as human beings, we are connected to ourselves and the world around us is really enriching. It is so much less lonely. So uh, that's probably where I'll leave it. Um, yeah, that's where I'll leave it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Renee. That was a, a wonderful and um, inspiring presentation. Um, and thank you again to, to all of our speakers. Thank you for taking the time very, uh, out of your days um, to come and speak to us. Um, I'm going to move on to the Q&A uh, section of our um, panel today. Um, and I'm actually going to open up with a question. I'm going to use my chair's privilege to open up with a personal question. Um, all three of you work in environments where there are, uh, you know, where you're surrounded by food every day. And uh, when you go back to your, your places where you live, um, are there any things that you have learned from being in those food systems that have changed the way that you personally manage your own food waste? So, for example, have you uh, and could you then share with us perhaps one each an example of ways that you manage your personal food waste? Sure. Um, uh, uh, shall I go first? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, there's some really practical things, I think. Uh, freeze your bread, free, slice and freeze your bread and toast it. Freeze your milk. Um, those, those are the two things I do mostly. Um, uh, learn how to cook. Um, like so, so much is about knowing what's in your fridge and just being happy and able to just cook something with it and and not always being so picky about what's for dinner but just making sure your fridge is emptied um put a compost bin in your garden uh that's four i think that's probably okay i'll leave some <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, yeah i mean um, like everything renee said obviously but i what else do i do i because i work at the shop so that i shopping is really easy for me and i love that the act of having to go food shopping it's like basically deleted from my life because i don't enjoy it going shopping it's like a whole other chore and um, i take a picture of my fridge before i go out i don't make a list but i just to remember what's in there um, and i get a veg box because as i mentioned i don't like shopping so even though i work there i make my business deliver food to my home <laughs> once a week and that causes me to shop economically and seasonally and then I just batch cook. So like when the veg box comes, I'll cook a couple of big pans of stuff and that sees me through the week. I'm a single parent and I work, I'm not like cooking from scratch every night, but I want to eat good food, so that's how I do it. And the other thing about getting a veg box is that because it comes weekly, you should know that your fridge needs to be empty the day before. So it puts you in my pocket. It puts you on a cycle for managing your food waste. Self management. Right. Yeah. Um, this meal prep. Meal prep is is something that I've started doing. So preparing meals and then freezing them, like when I said, uh, that works quite well. Just freezing things in general. And also, I I know it's not very practical, but try to grow your own food. It's really not that hard. Um, you can even, you know, you can grow salad on a windowsill. You can grow herbs on a windowsill. I've, uh, I know I'm a farmer, but I've started just growing more of my own food um, since since I understood really how much what the supply chain looks like. 
So uh, that's that's my advice. Thank you very much, all three of you. Um, so a specific question now for you, David. Um, we, someone has asked, uh, do you sell directly to the, your consumers? And if not, how can we buy from your retailers? Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that for that question. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're a really sort of young business. We've only started actually growing and selling things, let's say, two months ago. So right now, if you go to um, Zets Whole Foods in, in Netheredge, that's where you can buy our salad on the shelf. So if you work at the university, if you've got a catering event, uh, we're on the menu as a, as a super salad. So if you order that, you get our greens as well. Um, hey, David, what's your, what's your ideal lead time if someone wants to order a large quantity of salad? <laughs> uh ideal so we our crop cycle ideal lead time is our crop cycles which is 21 days from seed yeah. to harvest so three weeks that is that is ideal <laughs> um but yeah like, as, as i mentioned you can buy us in, in, in one shop right now or, or, or through the university but we're we're scaling up production so hopefully we'll be available in lots more places in, in due time. we don't sell directly to the public not yet anyway Thank you. Um, and now a questioner for, for you, Eleanor. Um, uh, so is the farmer the one that uses the bi a biodynamic cyclic system of cultivation, the farmer that you mentioned? Uh, no, the, the biodynamic, um, uh, so I just for the uninitiated biodynamics is like slightly different to organic. It's, it's a different, it, I don't fully, like haven't fully dabbled, but um, no, it's Martin who uh, trades as uh, Moss Valley Growers. It's the biodynamic grower at the Sheffield Organic Growers. Thank you very much. Um, and a question for Rene. Um, you said that the government is attributing most food waste to consumers. And as a consequence, the consumer is made to feel guilty. Do you think that meat eaters should also feel guilty, given your assertion that feeding animals is food waste? I think guilt is incredibly counterproductive. Um, and, and I think change happens through inspiration and not through guilt. So, no. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, and a question to, to all the speakers, if that's okay now. Um, we had a question from the audience, which is, uh, do you find it paradoxical um, that we, uh, that the viability of, given the viability of two of the enterprises rely on food waste itself? So is it paradoxical that a lot of the systems that we have use food waste? can i i because i'm not a food waste person because I, I mean like being is this little like bubble where everything is okay and we've got things beautifully set up um but we also like more widely we have to start from where we are now like yeah okay maybe there's a, a fictional future where this waste just isn't generated everything's like hyper local integrated with farms um you know and everyone has enough to eat but where we are now is that this waste is being generated so we just need to find a way of using it sensibly and like you, there's, there's only so far yeah i think like left politics in particular tends to try and kind of think too far without actually solving the immediate problems and, and what we have is like truckloads of stuff going to landfill so we should deal with that um, and for as long as it's necessary to deal with that um yeah so in our business it, it is quite paradoxical uh you're right that on the one hand we're using vertical farming local growing to minimize waste on the other hand our systems essentially run run on food waste but i i totally agree on with with eleanor it's right now we've got 9.5 million tons of food waste in the uk uh, of course that's decreasing every year i know uh, there are lots of initiatives looking at decreasing that, but that's, you know, that's, that's into the future. Right now we've got that problem and right now we need solutions that divert it from landfill or incineration and, and try to get as much value from it as, as we can. And you know, there are shops like Beanies that do lots of composting, like Renee gets to it before it becomes waste and distributes it to, 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 to people. Um, what we're doing is, is, you know, it's after that step and it's, it's, it allows us also to address sort of mixed food waste. So of course, lots of waste is produced, which can be composted, um, 
but you've got meat, you know, you've, you've got ultra processed foods. And uh, I think our, our way of doing it is, is, is really to tackle that from, from going to incineration and, and landfill. So um, it is paradoxical, but we are quite proud of, of our ways of extracting everything we can from a problem that's, that's kind of already there. It, it is important to not be the risk is that you become complicit in the problem right and and that is that is a genuine problem so i fully agree we are where we are and we need to make sure we do something about this and and, and work with this waste but there is at, at, at some point when the waste becomes your business then are you just incentivized to encourage it uh, that that is a genuine problem and i think it's really difficult for everyone to stay honest in that conversation you know by uh, 10 years ago, there was massive outrage uh, when it became clear how much food supermarkets were wasting. Um, then over time, this sort of charitable redistribution uh, happened. And But what hasn't happened is uh, stores haven't structurally changed their, the processes that they used to stock their shelves and price their products and all the things that led to that waste. The waste is exactly the same and sometimes worse. But they've just now found a palatable excuse to not have to make that structural change because they found a sticking plaster that has solved the problem. And so in that sense, sometimes organizations like Foodworks, you know, you could argue if we're not careful, are we actually, you know, the barrier to further structural change? And that's a really important problem. It's one of the reasons why we started to grow more food because we also need to have a viable transition out of this reliance on surplus and find a different way to structure our food system rather than just build a business out of a problem. Can I, can I follow that up then? Um, I think we'd already had a question addressing ideas of guilt and shame, but um, when we come to conceptualize food waste, uh, are we too often thinking about it in, in a negative sense? Is it too much considered a term that has a lot of baggage around it being something that is wrong and something that we need to change and do we need to have a more positive relationship with it or in fact is it very important that we do acknowledge that this is something that we need to solve and um, i think so one of the things that i was trying to emphasize is how how much beanies is designed around a like a people first way of doing things right rather than this kind of like boot through the till boot onto the shelf and um, and i think when you put people at the heart of a system design, we all, I think, basically, I think waste is a useful concept because we all have a like deep cultural understanding. Well, I think everyone is raised to not want to put food in the bin. Like there's a, and like more, like it's a morality that is like shared across cultures is that that's not the right thing to do. Um, so I think it's I think it's useful because it is more likely to be preventative and it is very deeply understood. It's not abstract. It's it doesn't that it does, it kind of knows no no boundaries really. Is this idea that like food is for it's we should eat it and not waste it. So yeah, I think it's an important concept for us to be working with. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think. I mean, we don't talk about food waste, we talk about surplus, and but, but the distinction there is that's because we we capture it just before it becomes waste, right? I, th I think waste is a bad thing. Uh, that's probably just a dic dictionary definition of waste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're right, I think, in like, you know, if we're looking at, well, things we no longer need, how you know, looking at it as an opportunity where we could do something that's positive by sharing something with neighbors or, you know, like rather than immediately labeling it as waste, that that is important. And in that sense, language and, and you know, it's, it's really important in how we conceptualize these things and then that guides behavior. Thank you very much. Um, a question now from the from the audience. Um, so someone has asked, uh, they're interested in getting involved with charities and groups like Foodworks and Chef Food, etc. Um, as supporting communities whilst conserving and caring for local environments simultaneously is where my interests lie. However, for your members, what skills and experiences do you look for when having people coming and help out? Uh, none. <laughs> if you're passionate, it sounds like you are, then come and join us and then you can learn things while you're here. Everyone's got skills already anyway, so maybe it's just a matter of finding somewhere where you no, fit it doesn't in. really matter. Like, oh, we just want a large group of people who are passionate about making a change, and then we'll figure the rest out together, I think. Mm -hmm. 
thank you. And then another question directly for you, Renee. Um, uh, so someone said, I wonder after using the recycle of energy systems by the waste in the vertical farming, is it worth in terms of energy uses comparing to impact the veggies from other countries that are able to produce a whole year round? In fact, that might be for David, I'm afraid. Um, David, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, so I wonder after using the recycling of energy system, um, but with the waste in the vertical farming, is it worth it in terms of the energy usage comparing to importing the vegetables from a country that is able to produce the vegetables the whole year round? I.e. That's, a, that's an in vertical. Oh, sorry, go on. Uh, uh, okay. I mean, wor worth it, I guess, in what, what sense? Is it economically worth it? I would I would say yes because it's it's it costs lots of energy to to chip it over, but also you've got the the aspect of water. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of lettuce I know specifically is is often imported from Spain. So, you know that that that's a country that's getting drier and drier every every year. Um, so we are in and, and lettuce is like ninety eight percent water. So we're doing it from Spain, okay, where we got plenty of it. So, you know, I, I, I think, I think environmentally, it is, is, it is, it is definitely worth it in in using a, a resource that is seen as waste. It's either burned or you know, it's piled up, piled up in, in some landfill somewhere, and 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 extracting nutrients from it. So, you know, extracting nitrogen and the phosphorus and whatnot from it and the, the energy potential to, to help mitigate the, the sort of the carbon impact from that waste and use it to grow food locally that doesn't have to travel. And food that has a longer shelf life and that is grown with, with a lot less water than, than uh, compared to outdoors. Um, I mean, we're finding it financially worth it. We're a young business, but, but economically it makes sense, but also environmental footprint of it us as well um but yeah that's that's our perspective thank you very much um an another question uh, anonymously from the chat um they say uh, they, they're glad that there are a few things being tried um if a system is run on food waste that is no longer waste reusing repurposing recycling for example um it is important whilst we have this for profit system that we're using so they appreciate very much what Rene presented in terms of the systems. But is there any way that we can expand knowledge within the community more for tackling issues like this? Um, um, you, uh, Rene. I would quite like to go back to if it's used, it's no longer waste, because that's not always true. Because there's different ways in which you can use food, right? So uh, if something is edible, but I don't have a person eating it, but it goes to anaerobic digestion. Have I wasted it? Well, I mean, I've recovered some bits from it because, uh, you know, I get some energy back from the anaerobic digestion. But I've also wasted a much bigger potential for someone else to eat it. So I think, you know, whether, some, whether something is used or wasted, it's not a black and white discussion. And if something is still edible, it should be eaten by a human being. If not, we've wasted at least some of the potential of it. Um, so I think that's a really important, you know, because some, some organizations say we have zero food waste and what they mean is we dump all our stuff in aer anaerobic digestion. That is not zero food waste. Um, and now I completely forgot the other half of the question. <laughs> Talking about how um, we can increase knowledge within the community of practices around reducing food waste. Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, I'm not sure it is primarily a knowledge problem, right? So, so there, there's just some knowledge like cooking skills and like, you know, making sure we do lots of stuff around food in schools is absolutely vital. There are things where knowledge really helps, but mostly really, I think these things, these decisions we make are emotional and whether I can be bothered to cook with the stuff that's in my fridge or whether I'm lazy and I'm going to just order a pizza because I can't be bothered tonight. I don't need new knowledge for that decision. I just need a different mindset and a different set of drivers, right? Most of food waste, I don't think is about knowledge. Thank you. Eleanor, did you have something to add there? Well, just the, the way that people shop, 
do, it does have a big impact on the generate on the way that waste is then generated and that um like supermarkets are set up to dictate not just what people buy but the quantities in which they buy it so like if you want one carrot so if you have to buy three that's how many's in the packet um and that, that like that comes down to culture and practice but it also comes down to access like if you live in clay cross and all you've got is the local like mini supermarket you don't really have the option to go and like buy loose in bulk from the grocers so i think there's a lot of i i, I guess like back to what renee's saying about like dumping all the uh like responsibility for this on the consumer actually like if people don't have access to the environment in which they can buy loose produce and they can only get the bus once a week to go shopping in a supermarket like their opportunities to limit waste and the way that they purchase food are going to be like vastly reduced compared to someone who can walk to beanies and like that person isn't necessarily like better off socioeconomically we serve a very very diverse customer base but some of it's about location and some of it's about opportunity so yeah i think um I, I just agree with Renee that it's not necessarily just about knowledge. There's so much else that feeds into that around behaviour and what people's opportunities are. Thank you. I think that uh, your answer to that uh, question may preempt your answer to this question that I'm about to pose to you, um, which is, do you have any insight into whether your customers know how to best utilise the food in your veg boxes? So they're speaking from personal experience with odd box. So they ran out, of, maybe sometimes ran out of space with fruit and vegetables. So sometimes it went off before they could use it. So they're questioning if there's like an educational job to be done with those boxes. I mean, yeah, definitely. I would say that like veg boxes work really well for some people and less well for others. So if you're willing to do like, oh, right, it's Friday, the veg box is getting ready, steady cook, what am I going to make? You know, I've, they would have had advance notice for what's coming in the box. So they might be able to like plan what extra bits they need. But, but basically like the veg boxes suit people who are, are willing and able to adapt their cooking to what comes that week and for those people it works really well like for me i just like to be told that like this is what's coming do something with it that's fine um and then the other thing that's been really interesting is we had to put our prices up but we've introduced a value box which is uh, it's 12 pounds organic veg box and that includes delivery and um it suits people who particularly want to batch cook so it's larger portions of the stuff that's like cheapest at that time we haven't seen a massive uptake of that box in particular which tells me that customers do prefer to have a little bit more variety for slightly more money it's only a pound extra for the standard boxes there is a certain amount of drop off for customers who who buy their boxes who obviously like it doesn't work then yeah i think i think the thing about beanies and and, and like veg box shopping in generally and renee's kind of outlined this is that it does depend and this is a much bigger problem. Uh, I think limiting food waste depends on people cooking and whether or not people cook is hugely informed by how much time they have. So like if you're in a family or any kind of household, both all of the adults are out to work for 10 hours a day and you've still got all of your other stuff to do when you get home, it's pretty difficult to be cooking from scratch every night. Like, and that's probably because your mortgage costs so much that the rest of your time is spent just trying to survive that's like that's not a food system problem <laughs> that is a that is a policy problem that is much much bigger than us so yeah i think like our customers who are cooking are able to make their own choices about mitigating food waste and probably do but there's a lot that happens outside of what beanie's services that i think goes way beyond the scope of the discussion we're having here yes Thank you very much. Um, this is a, a question from the chat, um, and, and uh, this is for everyone, though I imagine, um, Rene, you might have some particular experience with this. Um, so uh, a question, what advice would you have for people who live more limited lives? So people who maybe can't afford to turn the cooker on, people who don't necessarily afford to have a freezer for long-term storage or could only buy certain, um, you know, buy one, get one free offers, um, or, you know, or supermarkets that have disabled or can't go to supermarkets that don't have to say what access is. So is there any particular things around food waste for people who struggle more broadly in other elements of their day-to-day -day living? Um, yeah, I, yeah, probably. Um, so, so things like uh, dried pulses are incredibly economically um, 
sort of efficient uh, and require some more time and planning to make use of, but learning how to work with sort of dry pulses, uh, you know, in terms of nutrition, economic efficiency, and the amount of, um, um, yeah, so in, in terms of those two things, I think that that's, if I were to struggle more economically, I would probably make much more use of that. I mean, really practically speaking, it's also something that we try to do within Foodworks in the sense that, all the food we do is pay what you can afford. And and one of the reasons for that is that we feel that sustainable food should be something that's relevant for everybody. And so you can always come to Foodworks and get a good value mean meal uh, that is absolutely environmentally sustainable. Um, but that, that's a bit more self-promotion, but it's true in this case, so I'll put it in anyway. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Uh, hello, or David, anything to add? No, I was just going to um, mention that Foodworks do very economical frozen ready meals that are made out of their food surplus, um, which are very popular at Beanies, um, which we sell as a donation. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for two more questions. So, so um, the first one. Um, you all mentioned in your talks, I think one of the threads that really ran through them was the individual relationships that you have with, with both consumers and with people that you work with and other organizations in terms of managing that, that waste. Um, and also in terms of building alliances it, to sort of change policy directions. Is that something that we need to be working on more consciously, developing those, those links between people? Is that a key element to, to reducing those long-term challenges? Uh, just from a from a producer side definitely i feel like a lot of people don't fully in the spirit farm we don't fully understand how a farm works and how you know vegetables take time to grow and that it, it's very hard for a farmer to respond in, in, in 48 hours to a certain sort of surge in, in, in demand or something like that so i i, I feel like in in my relationship with least by explaining more about what it takes to grow things, how it works, what our grow cycles are. Like Eleanor asked, you know, I wish more people would ask me what what that process looked like, so then I can inform them and, 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 and so they can sort of make choices with, with those kind of numbers in mind. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely, I think relationships for food producer are, are key. Food waste. Thank you. Yeah, and and I think also like like information is really important. I think, and that's a great example. But it's sort of you know understanding lead times and that sort of thing. I, th I think there's also a real sort of you know it's about the emotional connectivity as well. Like I might be okay wasting a lettuce, but if I know David and I've got David's lettuce in my fridge, would I be just as happy to waste David's lettuce? I probably wouldn't, right? Like the strawberry you've, grow strawberry you've grown in your garden, you've got a different relationship with that strawberry than the one you picked up at Tesco's at a two for one. So I think, yeah, relationships are vital, both in terms of the understanding and building relationships that work. You know, like Ella mentioned the relationship with the farmer and how that's like a reciprocal, you know, really beneficial relationship. But I wouldn't underestimate the power of that emotional aspect of the connection as well. Yeah, agreed. And I think we, uh, I mean, like Beanies is, is a very resilient and very stable business and has this longevity that, I mean, we've outpaced like so many other food retailers <laughs> in the time that, uh, in the time that we've been in existence. And I think we have such a close relationship with our customers. It's really a part of that, like being a bricks and mortar store and um, having like, you know being there day in day out and educating people but even still you, like customers who you would you know they, they obviously have some understanding of what we do and why what we do is unique to the not unique but unusual within the industry and they're choosing to shop with us rather than in supermarkets but when the supermarkets all ran out of eggs last year because they were because of their price fixing behavior and what that effect that had on the commodity market I was still explaining to people from scratch why we had eggs and, and, and everyone else didn't, you know, and that's like, you know, we're well into, it was after the fuel um, shock 
spikes hit the salad and all of that sort of thing. So it's still, it's always this ongoing conversation, but having, having access to that is so important. Thank you very much. And our final question is, should we be asking Sheffield City Council to in, uh, introduce curbside collection of mixed food waste? Is that something we should be putting pressure on? I've got kind of mixed feelings about this because I, I'm not like, I don't love the idea of putting compost on a van and like shuttling it to the depot to then be like dealt with somewhere else. But I do totally get that like if you live in a flat or you for whatever reason like can't handle a compost bin that that might be a useful way to deal with it. So yeah, probably. <laughs> it, it seems like an all right idea. It's not like, it's not my favourite idea. I think my favourite idea would be like a collective compost bin on the street corner. But I don't know, we, the British have a huge aversion to like sharing bins. We all have to have our own separate bin for everything. So maybe a separate compost bin would just be like a welcome addition. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's a it's 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 a good idea on paper. It's, it's going to need like a lot of work in, in practice to, to really take off. I think uh, mix mixed food waste is a tricky one because you really have to educate people what they can and cannot and or should not put in a bin. I, just from speaking to anaerobic people in, in anaerobic digestion, you know what they often see is is a, a food waste bin is just too contaminated with other things for them to to really do anything with it except for send it to landfill so unless there i think there's a some education to do and, and some ramping up to do there before before we can implement it otherwise it, it won't really have a have an effect but if you know if that is done then definitely i think it's there, there's a lot of advantage to be gained in terms of carbon footprint you know, if that goes into composting or or anaerobic digestion rather than landfill or or incineration uh, so yeah thank you i'll be contrarian i like that uh, i think it's a bad idea um i think the idea that we're going to solve food waste by collecting it is is a bit weird right we if we still wasted it we've just collected it now um so, so I think the pretense on the which that policy was launched, which is exactly that, let's solve food waste by collecting it, you know, back going back to what does waste mean, right? If something was edible, but I, I put it in anaerobic digestion, have I wasted it? Yes, you have still wasted part of that potential. So I think we should be careful by providing fig leaves for a problem without providing a structural solution. And there is definitely a place for things that, you know, waste is going to be on some level inevitable. And making sure there's good ways to deal with that, I think, is important. I think curbside collections, which inevitably are going to be poorly sorted and therefore can only go to ID, AD because it's the lowest common denominator of sort of dealing with that waste, is the poorest way of doing that. Um, and I'd much rather that we look at things like community composting or other ways to deal with, with food waste that A, doesn't provide the pretense that it's a solution to just be allowed to waste food unnecessarily, um, and, and also make sure we actually still get the most out of all those, those nutrients rather than to all put it into AD 50 miles down the road. Thank you. Thank you all three. That was, um, that was really wonderful. I'm going to hand back over to um, Abigail now for some closing remarks. So yes, um, thank you everyone. We've only got a, a minute left, but I just want to say a really huge thank you to all of our speakers today so david eleanor and renee and also to ollie thank you for um chairing that discussion it was really really interesting and thank you to everyone who's attended i hope you've all um enjoyed yourself and sort of learned something new i know i've learned a lot of new things it's been really interesting to to find out about all the stuff that's happening sort of within the city where i live um so yeah and i hope sort of gaining a bit of a new perspective on food waste and and sort of where how we think about food waste itself um so yeah just finally we've got the sort of information up about step up sheffield which we talked about earlier and then on the final slide so if you really enjoyed this session and want to attend something similar then there are other sessions in the sort of coming weeks also run by grantham scholars and sort of they're all listed here and the sign up links are available on the festival of debate website sort of same as you would sign up to this one so yes, thank you very much for everyone and goodbye.
Thank you.